to the GHT Overland Podcast. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on the GHT Overland Podcast. Hey, Lisa, have you ever thought about seeing Norway? Yes, I actually have. Really? What? Well, I think I have ancestry back there on my mom's side. You think? Well, Denmark, Norway, somewhere around there. We should go check it out. Any guesses on the average temperature in Norway, in northern Norway, during July and August? The highest daily average high temperature is 71 degrees on July 19th. Did your research on July 19th and not the 20th? Nope. The 19th? Yep. How about winter? In the winter, the average temperature in Norway is a chilly negative 44.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my God. Yeah. Like your eyelashes are going to be... You're going to fall off? Have little icicles on them. Oh, just icicles. They'll melt? I hope so. (laughs) What are some other fun facts about Norway? One, the population is 5,312,300 as of August 2018. What day in August? You got the July nineteenth. Oh, I got the, month. the exact day. No, Google didn't tell you that. Nope. What's the population of Washington State? I don't know. About I'm seven point about... two million. Oh. Well, I'm learning about Norway. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that interesting? About five point three in Norway. Washington State has more people than Norway. Oh, we need to go to Norway. <laughs> <laughs> What are some other fun facts? Uh, Fact two, from late May to late July, the sun never completely sets in the most northern areas, where other areas have up to 20 hours of daylight. So kind of like Alaska. Yeah. That's super cool. I think you get a lot more done, wouldn't you? Because it's light out? Um, Well, mentally, yeah. Mm. You get your garden going. Absolutely. 20 hours of growing, minimum. Ooh. Uh, let's see. Third fact. The world's longest road tunnel is in Norway. Oh, that's weird. And Norway was neutral during the First and Second World Wars. That's crazy. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa, for the fun facts on Norway. And our new guests this week are currently overlanding in Norway, northern Norway to be specific. Super interesting to learn how they're working full-time as digital nomads and learning about their truck. Yeah, it's a uh, renovated shipping container transport truck, a 4x4, so that was super cool. Um, I forget exactly how many years, but I think we'll get into that a little bit more later. Our guests are originally from Germany. Their accents were super fun, and their energy and happiness was super awesome. So, with all these new fun facts, I say we launch into the official episode, or intro, I guess it would be. We already did the launch, so let's do a little Shane Brown. Yeah, Shane, bring it. Welcome, and thank you for joining us on the GHT Overland Podcast. This is where you get the greatest interviews and insights from overland travelers around the globe, learning from their stories and experiences as we interview overlanders from places like Australia, Africa, the Americas, Portugal, and today, Northern Norway. You will learn the basics to the advanced in overlanding, So buckle up and get ready for a new adventure. I'm Chris. And I'm Lisa. Today's featured guests are Carola and Stefano, 
both from Hamburg, Germany. Stefano is a graphic and web designer by trade. Aboard Fred, Stefano is in charge of all driving, craftsmanship, and is the official chill commissioner. Corolla is a marketing consultant professionally and takes the lead for all logistics, organization, and the kitchen. Aboard Fred, Carola is the social officer. Tom Tom is their stowaway, four-legged companion from Spain. Tom Tom is the taster, watchdog, and heartbreaker of the lady dogs. <laughs> Today, we are humbled to have Stefano and Carola join us to learn from their experiences and stories of overland travel. So, without further ado, welcome to the podcast, guys. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Great for having us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for taking the time all the way from northern Norway. What is it like there today? Well, today it's actually quite chilly. So um, the clouds are almost touching the sea, but we have a direct view on the Atlantic right now. But it's just six degrees. So it feels more like winter than actually uh, July. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Cool. So, hey, fill us in on any blanks we may have left out in your intro and tell us a little bit more about you. Well, actually, we started, well, our actual setup um, five months ago because we, um, well, full time moved into Fred, our truck, uh, on the 1st of March. <laughs> Uh, just before doing so, we uh, well terminated our apartment. So we've just left a container with some stuff. And we also got married after uh, 16 years. <laughs> so to start as Mr. and Mrs. K, our new journey. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. Yes, thanks. <laughs> so it's about seven in the morning for us. And that makes it, I believe, about four o'clock in the afternoon for you. Yeah, that's why. Or I think you would say 1600. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's Is that it. right? Okay. Now, you guys are currently obviously in northern Norway. Can you describe to us where you're at? Like, if you were to look outside right now, what would we see? Yeah, if you look outside and the moment we see the, uh, the, the ocean, it's uh, pretty flat today. It's uh, heavily cloudy. And um, I guess it's to mention we are staying uh, pretty exact on 71 degree, degree north. <laughs> so no so much left to the North Cape. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Actually, it's quite close to the North Cape. So we are facing one fjord and two fjords to the west. There is the North Cape. <laughs> Got it. Okay, cool. <laughs> So what inspired Overland Travel for the two of you? Well, actually, I think Stefano was already born with a nomad gene inside. So when we first uh, dated 17 years ago, uh, he already had a Land Rover and did several trips to the Sahara. And I just stepped into it and found it really fascinating. <laughs> I guess it's a combination between um, being free, you can do what you want every day, decide new, make new decisions, and being outside in the nature. Nice. And how <laughs> long in total have you been traveling as overlanders? Uh, I started my so-called overlanding career in 1996. Uh, there, I even don't know about the term overlanding. <laughs> I just traveled with a with a Land Rover, uh, made trips um, in Europe um, and North Africa to Morocco, um, uh, Libya, and Algeria. And after that, after well, a lot of years, we we decided to buy a, a, a truck. Um, a little bit smaller than this one. It's a seven and a half ton truck, um, and with this we yeah we traveled around in in Europe. This is, I believe, your third vehicle, right? So you started with a Land Rover, yeah. and then what, tell us about that progression from each of those vehicles. 
Yeah, well, the Land Rover was, well, uh, really basic. So that was really more, uh, well, quite really close to nature. So we had a possibility to sleep inside, but um, everything else, um, cooking and washing and whatever you do has to, well, take place outside, <laughs> which is great when you are uh, in, in a warm country and when the sun is shining. But um, <laughs> as we are coming from Hamburg and when you just do a weekend trip, um, in winter the weather can be really nasty <laughs> it's always raining and uh, so uh, there comes the point where we thought well actually it would be great to have a vehicle where you can stay inside and do cooking and not always get wet first thing in the morning <laughs> yeah that was that would be nice and that, Smart. that's when we came across well more or less by by uh by accident um on on our first truck we we discovered uh, him on the internet and uh well when we uh started the first visit we immediately fall in love with him and then we thought yeah we definitely have to get this truck <laughs> So, yeah, okay. and then we got really fixed uh, to, well, overlanding life because uh, with the truck, um, well, we were not that dependent on the weather anymore. So we did even trips in snow and minus 15 degrees. Um, we didn't care so much about that anymore. <laughs> so whenever we had some time, uh, we were outside with the truck, even if it's all for a few days. But uh, you don't have to care about the weather. You just have uh, to think about um, the time you have. And that's it. Oh, that's great. Was that setup something already you worked with or did you maybe make any alterations to it? No, we were lucky to find it. He was already a, a guy built it and he was. Uh, we just had to put our things into it and could start immediately. Although te yes. Stefano did some technical uh, modifications, yeah. we we added some uh, some solar panels to get uh, solar power um, and to be uh, independent. Um, but there are only a few modifications, optimizations, uh, so to speak. Well, with the gearbox. Ah, uh, yeah, that's one one point with the with this car was we we changed the uh, the gearbox. Um, to get um, better travel, travel speed and uh, lower uh, noise in the cabin. So um, that's brought us a um, lot of more comfort. Okay. So do you guys tend to spend a lot of time planning your trips? And would you recommend spending either more or less time planning to our listeners? Um, we don't spend so much time in detailed planning. We uh, just um, make a plan where to go, which direction to go, and um, about the time frame we have, and um, the rest um, we decide on a daily basis. So we ma don't make any detailed plans, just in general. But of course, we check out. I mean, if we travel in Europe, it's not that much of a problem. We check out uh, about well specifications for border crossing. So, for example, when now coming to Norway, you have to have certain treatments for the dog so that he's allowed to come into the country. And uh, of course, well, when uh, going to other countries like Algeria or, or Morocco, you also have to watch more things out up front to be prepared. <laughs> So that's actually, well, I think a tip we could give that for certain countries is it is important at least to be aware of all the paper stuff that might be necessary. Yes, that's that's a good thing. <laughs> okay, do you tend to just go um, like with TomTom -Tom to the local vet or how do you make sure that you've got all that paperwork set up before you cross a border? Uh, in, in general, the, the most of the part we did um, in, in Hamburg um, but the the for the for the tape worm um, we this we did in in uh, Sweden uh, because of the t time frame um, you have to take care for. He has to get this treatment um, five days, uh, at least five days or up to one day before you cross the border. So you have either you have to travel up really fast from Hamburg or you can go to a Swedish vet and then he gets uh, a remark in his passport. And then uh, the Norwegian uh, guys can see that he's got the treatment. <laughs> got it. Okay. 
That's that's the only thing they want to check if the paperwork is okay. They didn't want to see the dog or anything else. They only care about the the, the paperwork actually. Got it. So like Mitzi, Tom Tom has a passport. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You have to have one here in Europe. So uh, he's actually coming from a shelter in Spain, and so to get him to Germany. Uh, to, uh, eight years ago, um, we, he had to have this passport to be allowed to travel, <laughs> and uh, so it's yeah, like a, um, it contains his name and what kind of dog he is, and uh, then the vet can put all the information, which kind of vaccination he or other treatments he get, and then it's all in one document, which is quite fine. <laughs> this goes in conjunction with a uh, with a chip he gets, so um, he can be identified. Okay. So what besides a big white fluffy dog, what type of dog is Tom Tom? <laughs> oh, he's uh from the streets of Spain, we say. <laughs> uh it's it's a mix um maybe well, uh, what kind? <laughs> yeah, it seems that he's coming in Spain. They have these uh, kind of dogs guarding the um, big sheep herds there. So it's not like a border collie, but those kind of dogs that protect the sheep against bears and wolves. So he's more of a guardian dog. <laughs> okay. So um, although he's really relaxed, uh, he's always well uh, checking out the situation. And when we are in a really lonely spot, and it gets darker, and then all of a sudden someone is approaching us, he will definitely bark really loud and be very protective about us. God, well, that's got to be kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, sometimes it's quite good to have one watching out because he always realizes at the first if someone's uh, approaching or if something's happening around us. <laughs> yeah. So can you give us some details on Fred and why you chose this specific truck? Fred is from the Danish army. It's a 16-ton uh, 4x4 truck. And in its original configuration, it was a container transporter. So um, the former owner chose this truck to build a container with the same uh, measurements like a standard um, shipping container. So um, our our shelter is uh, exactly like um, like a container uh, in the measure measurements. Um, that's pretty handy, and the the container is also. Um, self-independent it's independent from from the vehicle so if something with a car totally breaks down it's possible to set the the box uh, to another um, truck okay so is it like an actual shipping like a sea container no no um, the box is uh, it's built of gfk um, uh, fully isolated. No, no, the the material it's uh, it's it's not steel. Okay, it's tailor made by a company who's designing these kind of uh, well uh, shelters shelters for truck life. <gasps> Got it. Okay, very good. Yeah, I mean, was we were really lucky again. Like with the former truck, we also found this on the internet, and um, it was exactly in the way we would have built it ourselves, because uh, that was the time when we decided that we don't just want wanted to go on longer travels but really to spend our time full time in the truck to live and work here and the former truck uh, we didn't have a fixed uh, bed we always had to build the seats to a bed at night and to well rebuild them uh, the next morning which is fine if you travel for some months but for well really uh, full time living and working um, it's better to have a bit more space and to have a bed and a table you can sit on at the same time so you're not getting a workout every day twice yeah <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're up to bed. yeah i'd love to hear about your kitchen and any specific details you really love about it well the kitchen is actually really great because it takes uh, the former owner he constructed it in a way that it's nearly two meters long says so, so there's a lot of working space um it has a three flame um stove and an oven which is quite great because we can make, well, really everything inside here. And it offers really a lot of storage space for dishes, but also for, well, all kind of uh, things uh, like pasta and whatever you want to store in a, in a cupboard. Mm, more cookies. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can also, yeah, yeah. I definitely have to test how the oven makes cookies. I haven't made them yet, but uh, it's just we already made pizza in it. And so that's quite fine because actually you can make it even it's pouring cats and dogs outside. Um, we also have our outdoor kitchen with a Dutch oven. So that also offers a lot of additional opportunities. But actually right here where we are standing uh, now, I would, uh, it's definitely nicer to cook inside. <laughs> <laughs> what is the one thing you value the most either on or in Fred? Well, I guess it's a, it's a whole setup only. So uh, we can work, travel, daily life. Uh, it's all um, possible without uh, so many yeah. compromises. It's, uh, it's a package that fits. Yeah, it's really our little tiny house on wheels, as we call it, because uh, when we sit here, we really feel, well, like being at home. Well, actually, it is our home because we don't have any apartment or anything like this. So uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just great. And then anything you originally packed that you never used or removed from your overall setup? Yes, uh, probably as well. We were uh, we don't have the apartment anymore, so we tried to use all our favorite things, which we thought would be really important. We moved them here into Fred, and as there's a lot of storage space, I think we might have a bit too much of dishes and probably also boots or hiking boots. Um, so far, we haven't used them all, so when we stop over in Hamburg again, we might leave one or two parts in our storage container. <laughs> But I think that's how it usually starts because you think, oh, I might need this and that and that. And then all of a found you found out, um, well, actually, you don't need that much stuff. And on the, on the other hand, by, by the truck, we all the stuff we have for recovery, uh, sand letters, um, ropes, etc. Um, we never used it yet with a truck, with a Land Rover. I used this yet, but not with a truck, but I don't want to miss it <laughs> because, um, if you have, have it, you don't need it. If you need it and you don't have it, you are in problems. <laughs> yep. yep. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> what are your current top two or three destinations along with a little detail on what made them so special for you? Well, actually, one of them is definitely Norway. We've already been here nine years ago. At that time, we visited the North Cape and uh, uh, went up to the Russian border. But then due to some flat uh, tire problems, um, we didn't have so much uh, opportunities to travel along all the little tracks here. And so uh, we already said at that time, we definitely have to come back one more because uh, up here in the north, it's... Uh, well, well, there are not much people living here. You have a great nature and you have an opportunity to stand on your own uh, on a lot of places. And, um, yeah, it's really breathtaking. So the different views on the Atlantic or on the Barents Sea, and uh, that's really something we like because we don't go so well we nearly never go to a camping uh, site so we most stay somewhere uh, out in the wild. Uh, I totally agree. But my all-time favorite place, I guess, was the Millennium Change. Uh, I made it in Libya, and I was sitting in the night on a huge sand dune with a glass of scotch. <laughs> that was my all-time <laughs> favorite. <laughs> That's great. Any other places that really stand out to you? Well, it's more the destinations we definitely want to go to in the future, but where we haven't been, well, due to a lack of time. So I think we definitely want to go to Russia and to Mongolia and also to drive down the Patagonia to Patagonia and South America. But so far as uh, Tom Tom is already, well, nine and a half years. Um, so we said, well, we start with the parts he can easily deal with and, uh, well, not to fly over to South America or something like this. He's too old for that. So that's uh, for later. <laughs> and on the other hand, for the, let's say, the next two years, um, we definitely need, need locations where we have stable internet and uh, reliable internet connection. And therefore, Scandinavia, it's, it's perfect. Okay. 
Yeah, because as we still, well, both are working, um, still, well, we, we worked as freelancer beforehand. And uh, so we took all our clients with us. They know that we are traveling, um, but they also know that they can reach us anytime there is anything to do. But that, of course, requires that you choose places where you can, well, guarantee this, uh, this internet uh, connection. <laughs> And here it's really great because it's so lonely here, but you always find an internet connection, even if there's, uh, yeah, just, it seems to be just rocks and the sea, but there is an internet connection. Otherwise, we couldn't talk to you right now. In most cases, fully broadband. Yeah, that's just wild. Yeah, that's really great up here in Scandinavia but because, well, we are coming from Germany and there are a lot of areas uh, outside the cities where you really are in trouble if you are looking for an internet connection. <laughs> so, uh, Yeah, we've heard that about South America as well, that uh, you'd be surprised how many places that you get a good uh, internet connection. Yeah. Cool. So what? Um, any tips you have for getting groceries and keeping them fresh? So do you have a set process in what you're going to get and how long it's going to last for you? We are lucky to have a, a compressor fridge, so that uh, makes it easy to store fresh vegetables, uh, at least for a certain time, although um, you can't keep them fresh forever. So usually... Um, we try to well, buy fresh vegetables if possible uh, once a week so that you have some for the coming days also with uh, meat or fish or something like that and if uh, well sometimes or more and more often now that we have no time limit um, we decide to stay at a place for more than a week uh, because it's so nice and then we have uh, well still a lot of other things like pasta and dried food uh, which we use then or Stefano has to catch a fish that is also <laughs> possible here <laughs> and what is a favorite meal or recipe you enjoy while traveling well, on the one hand, it's things that we can really, typical things that you can get uh, from the locals. So obviously here in Norway, it's salmon um, that is really great here or king crabs. We just had some uh, a few days ago. So that's really great. And... Um, well, and and we like to well compose our own meals with what is left in the fridge. So it's more of a well, we call it gumbo when we made something like this. Just looking into the fridge, what do we have? What do we have for other things to add? And then just make a little um, surprise meal out of it. Sometimes those are the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you can never pass on the recipe for it because uh, you actually <laughs> don't know uh, how you built this wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you generally do your laundry on the road? Um, Small, smaller things. Um, we have a, a so-called overlander washing machine. Uh, it's uh, a, a greater um, plastic drum. You uh, do in your stuff, add some water, add some soap, and you uh, uh, strap it to the front bumper and uh, drive the day. Let the, let the street uh, do the work. <laughs> Um, that, but that's only um, possible or workable um, for for smaller things, t-shirts, underwear, and and so on. And from time to time, um, we have to visit um, either a campsite or what's also very nice places um, are marinas in a in a harbor. They are quite quite good in in the um, equ equipped. And mom, in most cases, it's a, it's a nicer ambiente. I never thought about marinas. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great. Yeah. They, yeah. they have everything. And uh, in most cases, um, they are uh, quite, quite, quite comfy. Mm. Yeah, because on most on the camping sites you have a well a lot of well the, the 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 white campers as we call them. So, but in the marinas you also have well a lot of people coming with their boats there, and so you can also meet very interesting people there because they all want to do their washing, and so everyone is me meeting up in front of the washing machine, and uh, where well, you have uh, little uh, nice little chats, and that's always fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and you can mm. still enjoy the view on the sea. Uh, obviously, um, well, we are we really love to choose places where we can either have a look on the sea or on a lake or on a river. So uh, I think we, if possible, well, apart from the Sahara, we always uh, choose a place close to the water. <laughs> I bet those are some good conversations when you meet up at the marina with a combination of a sea traveler yeah. and a land traveler. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but there are also similarities uh, with the sailors. Uh, even the uh, who doing uh, long dis distances, um, they have same same problems only on the water. Also, it's 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 the same uh, same theme uh, from another perspective. <laughs> And hygiene. Do you have a shower and toilet set up? And what are your recommendations for our listeners to keep it simple and hygienic on the road? Yeah, well, now in, in Fred, we are really lucky. We can say we have a bathroom, which is, sounds really, uh, which is really <laughs> luxurious. Uh, well, with a, with a dry separation toilet and a shower. And um, I mean, that's for us because we come from a Land Rover there. We just had a, well, a little uh, 20 liters of water. So there was not, not, not that much of a shower and we didn't have, of course, a toilet. So it's now, well, we are getting older now. So we have to have a little comfort. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's really great. But of course, you can also handle it. I mean, we still, when from time to time, when we are traveling with the Land Rover, it's not that much of a problem. As we are so fond of places close to the water, there's always a possibility. If it's not winter and it's frozen, you can jump in a lake or in a sea um, also for for uh, washing your clothes. And uh, or you have for those in between days, you can use those uh, wet uh, wet wipes. Uh, wet wipes and uh, things like that so, so and we also we also have uh, uh, outside an outside shower which is all which is also uh, very ha very handy to use so to don't have to clean up the the mess in the bathroom after after the shower that's pretty handy <laughs> And so, it's also good for Tom Tom if he got into some mud, uh, then you really can just true. shower him outside yeah. before he gets inside the car again. <laughs> yeah, I bet you probably use it more for Tom Tom to rinse him yeah. off. <laughs> yeah, as he's so fluffy, he collects everything. He collects all little branches and whatever. He sometimes looks like like a lunatic with all the nature on it. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like a five star hotel. We must visit. <laughs> yeah 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 it's it's actually it's really uh yeah it's uh well we we looking at our development how it how we lived in the land rover and how it's now it's uh but we always say okay we haven't any apartment or house so this this our house so can be a bit more luxury <laughs> yeah but it's still four wheel drive and so it's uh it's a combination of both worlds <laughs> And there's, is there anything you change about your current setup with Fred? One thing we changed was um, on the forehead, uh, the former owner had installed um, tires with inner tubes. And as far as I can say, with all the cars we had, if we uh, drove on inner tubes, we always had trouble. So the first thing we changed was um, new rims with tubeless tires. That's uh, highly recommended. <laughs> but uh, also on this car, we first made the change after we had the first uh, flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> and do you find that, just to back up a little bit pertaining Fred, do you find that it is reliable for you or do you end up doing a lot of regular maintenance? No, the maintenance is um, just filling up the diesel, looking for the oil and you're ready to go. There's no so much to care about the the, uh, the truck. It's uh, pretty reliable. It's pretty robust. Um, so... There's there's no so much to do. Um, regular maintenance in the workshop, yes, um, everything what what's to do. But there's it's it's pretty uh, it's it just once. <laughs> yeah, it's quite okay. robust. I mean, it's twenty four years, but it's uh, yeah. yeah uh, it's, the, the truck is from nineteen ninety five. 
Um, as I said, it's it's from the Danish army, so it's nearly in the standard condition uh, like it was in the army, besides um, some extra fuel tanks. And the the, the shelter is built in uh, 19, uh, 20, 2014. 2014. Okay. So tell us about that number one biggest challenge you've had to overcome on the road. Yeah, well, actually, or luckily, we didn't have, well, really big challenges. We had a lot of well, smaller breakdowns, um, but uh, I think the one that took us most time, it wasn't dramatic, but it just took a lot of time with when we were with our former truck, to the, when we went to the North Cape. We already discovered on the way up that we had uh, well, a, bro problems. Pro yeah. a, broom, uh, a problem with the worm. It, it broke and um, we had spare tires, yes, but um, they, were, they are not um, pretty good balanced. So um, the truck was um, jumping over, <laughs> over the road. So it was not manageable to drive faster than 40 kilometers or so uh, this that, that took a lot of time to find to find a workshop who was um, willing and able to to fix that problem not it's not not serious problem but yeah if we have it you it's it's a mess <laughs> Yeah, that's going to be really hard to drive when it's uh, when a tire or yeah, a wheel is yeah, yeah. balanced was, correctly. Yeah, but that's not real trouble. No. It's, um, you lose your comfort, you lose a lot of, lot of time, but uh, it's not what you say trouble. No, actually, yeah, we haven't been there. all those years. Haven't been through any really dramatic situations. So just let's knock on wood. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, it stays <laughs> like this. <laughs> Another dog with a passport? Early in the morning, start gathering my bones. Oh, Misty would be excited. Kind of cool. So good info for people overlanding with dogs, especially in Europe. I have to think it's awfully nice to have a dog's nose with that deep bark in those dark, unfamiliar places. Yes. To warn you of critters or... People, or what else would there be? Spirits. <laughs> Only if you drink too much scotch. Ah, uh, good point. <laughs> cookies? Yes, cookies. That was the first thing you thought of when she mentioned the oven? Yes. I was thinking pizza pie. Oh, no. It's got to be cookies, because that's kind of quick and easy, and different flavors. But I think I'd start with peanut butter. Oh! <laughs> no. Yeah. You just want them for you. When yep. will the snickerdoodle and chocolate chip come? Oh, in second and third place. I'll wait for that. All right. With good coffee and good scotch. There you go. So Norway seriously sounds like an amazing place to go. The place of the midnight sun, northern lights, and good cell and Wi-Fi signal. Who'd what have could thought? be better for a uh, digital nomad? Yeah. And then I really liked how reliable their truck sounds uh, for a 24-year-old truck. Less messing around with fixing things would be super cool so that you can just go over landing and see some amazing places that are off the beaten path and not having to be fixing stuff all the time. Yeah. In a like, Walmart parking lot. Well, their scenario was previous build was absolutely a perfect fit for them. Yeah, there's got to be an advantage to this being their third truck. So they started with a Land Rover, moved up from there. Um, and that's got to be kind of handy to kind of work out all the kinks and figure out what works best for your style of doing things, especially if yeah. you're working full time from the road. Yeah, I can see where they want more elbow room. Yeah, well, and they're in a colder place. It's not like they're in the southern hemisphere where it's flip flops and board shorts. True. But th I like do that like makes Norway, a difference, but right? when you just said that, oh, yeah. Board shorts. Flip flops. 
<laughs> oh, I'm getting off track. Sorry. All right. So that was part one. Next week on Thursday is part two. Our interview with Carola and Stefano is our longer format interview. So we split these into two episodes for your downloading pleasure. Don't worry. New episodes are released each Thursday. In next week's episode, we learn more about the finer details of Corolla and Stefano's overlanding setup with Fred, discuss finances, and enjoy more road stories from their travels, learning valuable tips and ideas, especially for those digital nomads. I will have my pen and paper. Remember, it's a good idea to visit the show notes page on our website at ghtoverland.com slash podcasts. Select, oh, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> Heimer Hoffen. Heimer Hoffen. There's an R? It's German. Oh, boy. Remember, select the Heimer Hoffen episode. All the details and helpful links are already there for you. As a reminder... All the show notes are now on our Patreon page after hitting our maximum number of pages on our primary web host. So just a friendly note. However, everything is there and everything is free. So no worries there. All the links, the downloads for episode one and episode two, once it goes live, are all listed right there. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters. Your support of the podcast seriously means the world to us. If you'd like to help support the show and get a t-shirt, coffee mug that doubles as a GNT mug at night, take a look at the options while you're there. Then be sure to send any questions, suggestions, and feedback to ghtoverlandpodcast at gmail.com. We would love it if you would connect with us on social media at ghtoverland. Be sure to share this episode with your friends who enjoy travel and adventure. Overlanding travel is all about meeting new friends, seeing the most amazing places on earth, and of course, new food and new drinks. If you enjoyed the episode, it would mean the world to us if you slid over to rate and review the podcast. Then be sure you're a subscriber. It's free and you get automatic uploads with each new episode. So you can listen to it offline. So go give GHT Overland Podcast a little extra love on your podcast platform of choice. Thank you, and we will see you next Thursday for part two of the GHT Overland podcast with Carola and Stefano. Bye.